that the work which is likely to be our most durable monument is a work of bare utility. Not a shrine, not a fortress, not a palace, but a bridge. The peculiar grace of a shaker chair is due to the fact that it was made by someone capable of believing that an angel might come and sit on it. I can't remember any Saturday night that I went anywhere that we didn't talk about killing you alone. It was a normal conversation. America is not an actuality, but it's a potentiality. The Civil War was fought in 10,000 places, from Valverde, New Mexico, and Tullahoma, Tennessee, to St. Albans, Vermont, and Fernandina on the Florida coast. More than 3 million Americans fought in it, and over 600,000 men, 2% of the population, died in it. Everyone had always understood that New York City represented Prohibition's biggest challenge, the ultimate battleground between wets and dries. Nobody could kill it any worse than what it was. It was that bad. And the, the goal there is to break the suspect down into a state of despair, into a state of helplessness, so that the suspect gets worn down and is looking for a way out. At this point, I'm like, I'm just going to make up something and include these guys' names. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. A new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men, that all men are created equal. He set lofty goals for himself and his country and pursued them with a cheerful deviousness that sometimes appalled his allies and often disappointed his wife. He might have been happier with a wife who was completely uncritical 
that I was never able to be and he had to find it in other people. We get the word cancer from the Greek crab, carcinos, which in Latin becomes cancer, because what you see is a mass of tissue in the center, and it's as though legs are reaching out. Jackie Robinson laid the foundation for America to see its black citizens as subjects and not just objects. It, 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 it meant that there were six and seven and eight year old boys who suddenly thought a black man was a hero. On the morning of the next day, the 15th of March, 1939, we heard the news. The German army was crossing the border and occupying the entirety of Czechoslovakia. We had started walking up and we'd probably gotten about a third of the way up the hill and then they un unleashed on us. We were in the middle of this horrible shit sandwich. That's what we called it. One of the things that I learned in the war is that we're not the top species on the planet because we're nice. talk a lot about how well the military turns, you know, kids into, you know, killing machines and stuff. And I'll always argue that it's just finishing school. Dr. Mayo had a simple philosophy he tried to impart to his sons. The needs of the patient come first. They wouldn't treat diseases. They would treat people. And they would do it with the Sisters of St. Francis. Medicine is a science, but how we interact is layered with all kinds of other issues, all of which have to do with health. And so if they don't have faith in the caregivers, if that patient doesn't have hope, we're gonna have a lot of trouble, you know, even attempting to make them better. Faith, hope, and science those three things are absolutely critical. Scott Stevenson, I'm the President and CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution, and uh, really excited to have you all here. I'm curious, how many of you are visiting for the first time today at the museum? Right, we've got some people here before. Well, I hope you will not be strangers. I hope you saw some interesting things up in the galleries. Uh, before I introduce Ken, who doesn't need any introduction, I just wanted to say, as, as uh, students who are interested in careers in film, um, I'm somebody who actually hires a lot of people who work in film, so I'm, I'm really excited that you're here and seeing all the ways that we use uh, film to convey history in the museum setting. And actually, all the curators who work here, and uh, I recently found in a conversation with Lonnie Bunch, who was the founding director of the Museum of African American History and Culture for the Smithsonian, he also has his curators who are developing exhibits study filmmaking um, because 
what we do up here is like creating a movie you can walk through, you know, learning how to construct stories, um, uh, narrative arcs, etc. is very relevant to the work we do. So uh, filmmaking is such a, a powerful uh, medium. And so really excited to introduce Ken Burns, who, as I say, needs no introduction. And I know you all have come in here with lots of questions, and so we're really, really excited to get it going. Well, Scott, thank you for, uh, for being here. I, I don't want to waste too much of your time. Just to say that when I was uh, your age at the end of the 60s, I was given a 8 millimeter camera by my dad, and that was sort of it. I just started, that's film, actually film, not digital, but it, it just sort of set me off on my uh, path. And I would love to answer the questions that you might have. I don't want to waste uh, any of your time just telling you what I think you should know. I'd rather respond to what you do want to know. So don't be shy. Yes, I knew you weren't going to be shy. How long were you in I have been a filmmaker, well, I mean, I think I would count January of 1972, so that's 47 years I've been doing it. Uh, and I've made a lot of films, all in American history, or most of them in American history. Yes? What made you want to The question is, what made me want to go into documentaries? Um, it's interesting. I started off wanting to be a filmmaker uh, very early on, at age 12. Uh, but that meant then, as it does now to many people, to be a Hollywood director. But I ended up going to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, which was a new experimental school that had just opened. And all of the people in the film de department were also still photographers and interested in now. They were filming how people of all kinds and all races and all classes lived and interacted. And it sort of changed my molecules so that I became interested in documentary. And then somewhere along the line, I'd had a, a pretty um, strong interest in American history, which is, I think, the best teacher. Right? History itself is the best teacher we have. It does not always seem immediately relevant to people, but it, you know, human nature doesn't change. So if you study the past, you're understanding a little bit better about the present. And so almost every film that I've worked on, I think you guys saw the retrospective reel of all the films, yeah. there is not a film that I've worked on there that I couldn't take that, that film and just tell you things about it that are also about today. So that's, that's what I do. <laughs> Students, I'll pass you the mic when you're going to ask a question. Who's next? And I'll give it yeah, you, sure. you did the, um, well, you did a documentary on the Jogger Five, right? The Central Park Five, yes. Yes. So how long did that take you to do? Well, it's a, it's a long and complicated story. It came out in uh, 2012. My oldest daughter was in college in 2003, and she had a summer job between her junior and senior year in New York City with the civil rights law firm that was suing the city on behalf of three of the five, um, then boys and now men. Um, and she got to know them, and she wrote her final paper, her final thesis at Yale University on the representations of race in the media of the time, and, and supposedly a progressive city like New York was using the same kind of language about wilding and wolf pack and beasts and animalistic imagery that the newspapers of the South had used during the Jim Crow era in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And it was a stunning piece. And she thought she was going to go to law school, but when she finished, she said she wanted to write a book about them because no one had ever asked the question, who are you? It was just assumed that it was done by these five black and Hispanic boys. It was just assumed that they were guilty. They had confessed. But after coerced confessions, you know, after interrogations that lasted 30 hours. And so she wrote a book. It took her several years to do that. It was published. And it was, at that time, we said, we have to make a film about it. So we worked for another three or four years on the film. And then it came out. And uh, it is um, Mayor Bill de Blasio, who is the current mayor of New York, the previous mayor, uh, had refused to even consider uh, paying them for their false uh, imprisonment. 
and they served out their full terms, upwards of 13 years for children. They were 14, 14, 15, 15, and one developmentally challenged 16-year-old who served almost 14 years in jail. And when Bill de Blasio came in, he said that it was the film that convinced them that it was right for the city to settle, and they did settle and, and paid, uh, you can't pay anybody enough money for what they lost. And I wish, you know, I don't need to tell you, but I wish I could tell you that this is a unique story. It's just not, it's happened every day, it probably happened today, so it is. Did you individually meet all of them? Oh yeah, no, we've got, they were friends. We went to their, one of their wedding and, and we're, you know, they come to my birthday party and, you know, yeah, they're, we're, we're very close, we're, our families are sort of intertwined now. And my daughter and my son-in-law and I made the film. And so, you know, we're very much connected. Uh, three of them are now in Atlanta. Two are still in New York. And so we see the New York ones often. But it's funny, we're getting to Atlanta for a variety of reasons. So we're bumping into the other three there. And they moved to get away from the city. It's funny that they went back to the Deep South where all of this was supposed to be a problem. And of course still is. Um, but it's, it's an interesting story. That's all the questions I had for you. Well, that's, that's great. Yes. Thank you, Scott. So, when making your documentaries and coming up with the topics, like, how do you come up with the topics? Like, are they something like you always been interested in, or something that you started off with, stumbled off across the way? Or how do you come up? With it's you know the the sometimes the the way that I sometimes say it is I don't choose them they choose me. Um, I have a lot of ideas in my head you know, lists of dozens and dozens of subjects, but they have to drop out of your head and into your heart before you say yes to them. And they're all in American history, and they're all dealing with classic American themes that recur over and over again, about freedom sometimes, that's the, mo the biggest question, and that's a complicated question because it's not just um, a single idea or an abstract concept, it's also there's collective freedom, what we need, that is often in conflict with personal freedom, what I want. And there's, there's an interesting tension that happens there. It isn't just manifested in, in other big mo movements that we study. It's also deeply psychological. Obviously, race is at the center of the American narrative. I wish it wasn't true, but, you know, the guy down the street wrote the Declaration, right? And he said, in the second sentence, that is in, you know, carved into the wall, the outside wall of this building, says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, right? I'm not a third of the way through that sentence, but I have to stop and tell you that he owned over 200 human beings. And he didn't see the contradiction, he didn't see the hypocrisy, and he, more importantly, didn't see fit in his lifetime to free any one of those people, and set in motion, both symbolically, but also literally, an American narrative that was always going to be struggling with this, what historians have called our original sin as Americans. And so obviously it's still, and I don't need to tell you, this is an everyday thing. And and we address it in all, I, I can count I can count on the fingers of one hand the films of ours that don't actively deal with race. You know. And another question. Yeah. So we saw the list of like films that you're working on for like ten years from yeah. now. Yeah. So, when, so well, I always have to say God and funding really. <laughs> yeah. So when you're like planning those out, like do you do it so that all of them like go together cohesively? Yeah, yeah. We hope that there is what we would call an economy of scale. So David Sh Schmidt, please stand up. Um, he is the co-producer of a film that um, I'm making with him on Benjamin Franklin, as you saw, but also the American Revolution, which is one of the reasons we're here. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so you hope that, that you can, things you learn in Franklin, you can apply to revolution and vice versa, and do that. But there's not a real set plan, as much as there is, we know these are the subjects we want to tackle. And it could be that one or two of them would change, or be swapped out for something else, or would say, you know, eh, we're not going to do that. But the, I just finished a film on country music, the history of country music, which is um, pretty interesting. It'll be out this fall. It's eight episodes. It's 16 and a half hours. And um, what we were going to do wasn't that 10 years ago when we did the last 10-year plan. You know what I'm saying? So we have a little flexibility, but most of the first six or seven films are already underway, and, and we're working on them.
Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Where do you start? That's a really, really good question. Um, you know, we do a lot of reading. We do a lot of talking to scholars. We do a lot of uh, research in the museums and archives that have material that we might use. We start interviewing people. We start working on a script. We start shooting other things. And then all of our films are made in the editing room when we're trying to sort of figure out how to tell the story. I mean, as Scott was saying, there are kind of laws of narrative um, that apply to how we all tell stories, you know, beginning, middle, and end, a protagonist and antagonist, a climax, certain character developments among those people that are in it, and a denouement, the end of it, um, that are sort of lawful. And so we have to f understand how those stories apply to the particular subject we're, we're dealing with, but also how they apply to presenting it in a film as opposed to, say, a gallery room. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, and also a film made for here is really different than a film that I would make, right? There, there are many, many overlapping uh, things like the use of archives and music and narration and sometimes first person voices, but there's, um, there, there's really different things because they're expecting you to come in and watch for only a few minutes. I'm asking you in the case of some of our films to commit you know, 18 hours or 18 and a half hours for a nine or 10 part series, which means we've got a level of storytelling that's not like I'm on a school trip, but I gotta hook just anybody with a good story. Yes? Um, how do you manage um, all those stories? I know like when I get to my own projects, it just immerses into my, my life, it just takes over everything. Um, so how do you do that? I mean, like, I, I, I love Vietnam, I think I was, probably my favorite of all your work I've seen. Um, like, how does that not just take, take over your entire life for like 10 years and do anything else? And I saw the list of films you have coming. How are you able to spread and keep your mind divided in each one of those categories? With, you know, when you're doing such great work and something that takes so much time to even just produce one. Well, the, the, thank you. The, the, the Vietnam War did take 10 and a half years from when I said yes to when it was broadcast. But I had, I thought the luxury, as overwhelming as it is, to be working on several films at once, so I could leave early on in the editing process, the editors, and it might take them four months to catch up with the notes that I, that not just me, but we collectively gave. And then that gets a shorter and shorter turnaround time until the very end. You're just living in the editing room for the last couple months, uh, locking the film. But going out and working on something else, particularly something that's completely different from the previous project, helps to sort of wipe the slate clean helps you see that new project that you're going into freshly, helps you go back to Vietnam and see it in a way that people like David Schmidt, who are working on the Vietnam film every single day, may or may not have perspective. But it also allows a different eyes. And so, but it is all consuming. I mean, the films in their totality, you know, we're 80 to 100 hour a week people and, and um, there's not much else, you know, that we do. Whoa, the oh, you with the microphone always helps. Um, um, so I've heard somewhere that making documentary films is a way of like reviving or bringing back the past. Um, like, do you do you believe that that's true, or do you? What, what's your take on that? I I think so. I mean, certainly the work that I do, that's the intention, is to make the past come alive to remove the arrogance we have in the present over the past, that somehow because we're alive, we're somehow hipper than they were, it's just not true, that they didn't have as complicated a lives as we do, not true, that they didn't have conversations as deep and as meaningful as the conversations you have with those closest to you in your life, not true. And if you can do that and understand that their needs across race and class and gender are and geography are the same as yours, in a way, and yet really distinctively different, then you've brought that past alive. And you do this in lots of ways, with still photographs that you animate, in a way you may come alive by the way you move the camera around it, by using, as I was saying, first-person voices in addition to a third-person narration, by the kind of music you use, by the sound effects to wake up that photograph, in a way. And so, yeah, I think, I think what we're aiming for is to kind of wake the dead and remind us, as I was saying, that, that history is is the best teacher. So certainly in my stuff, but documentary is a whole range of stuff. And most documentaries are known for being 
about the moment, very topical. They, they're, they're very big for a year, and then they, can't, they don't really have a life beyond that because they're about some issue. And then it's gone. It may be important to look back at it as a work of documentary art or something, but it has a different sort of thing. I'm interested in stuff. My, my film in the Civil War, which came out 29 years ago, is still shown hundreds of times a day in schools all across the country. Now, not all of it. It's 12 hours. But you, you know, you, there's somebody somewhere right this moment, because today's a school day, is watching um, the Civil War series. In a, in a classroom, and that's what I like. Not only the idea of, of um, waking the dead, bringing the past to life in a way that makes you, a good example would be in the Civil War, that you would go to Ford's Theater. Do you know what happened at Ford's Theater on April 14th, 1865? Okay. Lincoln was shot, he died. The assassination was complete the next morning, the 15th. But he was shot that night and dragged across the street to a boarding house where he passed away the next morning. But Good history is making you think that maybe it won't turn out the way you know it did, right? That the way you told the story is so engaging that you would think that maybe this time the gun would misfire. This time somebody would stop Booth. And if you can do that, and I've had a lot of people say that the series, they were on the edge of their seats hoping the gun wouldn't go off. And that, you know, when you're using a still photograph of an empty Ford's theater uh, and you've got the shot on the soundtrack of a gun, and if, if you've done that, then that makes you feel really good. And with regard to Vietnam, uh, sir, you were talking about the Vietnam film. Um, I just had um, someone tell me that, that they are friends with a Vietnam veteran who asked, because I live in this tiny little town in New Hampshire, asked if, and she does too, asked if, if she knew me. And she said, yes, she did. He goes, well, tell him I have a friend who's been in and out of VA hospitals since the war, the Vietnam War. And uh, he sat down and watched your film five times. And he said to him, I think I'm all right now. Now, I don't know if he is all right, but that's the best review you could ever, ever have about a film, right? It gave him closure. Yeah, yeah, it gave him some closure. Because it was so hard for us to do, hard to watch, and yet honored their experience. And we're getting this from veterans all the time. I, I just have to add, I don't want to take the time to students. But I, I watched several interviews and, and things. I was really enamored with, with the work. Um, so after that, I watched like several interviews and panels, discussions and things on YouTube about it. And there were some people who um, felt that for whatever reason that it did not represent um, people fairly or that, I mean, it felt very balanced to me throughout. throughout. But there were people who felt like um, that you were patronizing the Vietnamese or patronizing the Viet Cong. And I, I didn't get that, but I was... Had to think twice. Like, where where did they get that from? How and, do you, how and this do you is in that? America right now that you've Could got you division <laughs> and people who are opposed to things just for the sake of being opposed. Yeah. So, but how do you how do you take that? I mean, you know that you 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 presented, a, I think, a very fair. First of all, we honored the Vietnamese. We had Viet Cong guerrillas, our enemy. We had South Vietnamese civilians, which no one ever interviews, and South Vietnamese soldiers, which they don't interview. We had North Vietnamese soldiers, which people hadn't done to compliment the American soldiers. They sounded a lot alike, and. I think what happens is we live in, a, in an era preoccupied with division. It's impossible for anything to come out without a, a, a few people on either side of the spectrum needing to find fault with it, you know, just because it's there. I mean, they could blame the air that they breathe for something, right? So we, we, we're totally used to it. It's, 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 it was a non-starter. We had a war room of distinguished... Uh, folks who were politicians in, in, in on both sides of the aisle who were ready, willing, and able to go to bat for us uh, if there was a serious uh, thing against the film. Nothing ever happened. The problem with the internet, when you go on YouTube, is that it equalizes. Like, you could, uh, I, I go home tonight and go flat earth society and listen to the people who believe the earth is flat. And somehow the fact that they are given, because you're watching it, some significance is sort of in and of itself one of the inherent problems of social, and I don't even think it's social, I think it's anti-social media. Right. There's a documentary about it on Netflix. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah. You know? Yes? How long do you plan on being in this early career? Um, well, I, I don't. I don't like to use the word career because that suggests there's like. I mean, I, I know if you want to become a doctor, I can tell you what to do. If you want to become a lawyer, I know what you have to do. 
as filmmaking, it, all the people I know working in documentary film came at it at completely different ways. So it doesn't feel like a career as much as you found what you were supposed to be doing, and I feel very lucky. So there's no reason to not keep doing it. I mean, as long God and funding willing, right? As I said before, I love my job. I think I have the best job in the country. It educates all of my parts. I travel all around the country. I met a guy today who stopped me on the streets in Manhattan and said, I love your work. I'm from Kansas City. <laughs> as if those were not a non sequitur. And I go, I love Kansas City. And as he walked away, I went, I really do love Kansas City. And I was thinking of the last time I'd been there, so. Yes. Um, I noticed in a lot of the American Revolutionary stuff that we watched, a lot of the previously still pictures, like the soldiers were moving around, the gunshots were being fired, what was used to create that movement? It's called recreation. That's what it is. It's what Hollywood does. I, I don't like recreation. The most I've ever done is in a four-hour film, two-part, two-hour film on Lewis and Clark because we had to show what the expedition looked like in order to understand what they were seeing as they went across the continent for the first time as white people. It was already home to 30 or 40 nations uh, whose land they went through. And we needed to understand what they saw as well. But we did at maybe two minutes, maybe three minutes tops. And so we, we try to avoid that. And we're right now working on a history of the American Revolution, which we hope, we're very early stages, we hope not to have to resort to reenactments without, unless it's really intimate things. You know, somebody sewing a buckskin by, by firelight, somebody, you know, maybe the discharge of one um, musket, maybe the, a clopping of one horse through a puddle, you know, something like that, and hope that we can do it with graphics, you know, printed newspaper things, um, not photographs, obviously, but uh, drawings and etchings and paintings and uh, uh, computer-generated maps that would just give you a sense of positions and things like that. It may be impossible, and we may have to resort to that, but we hope not. Yeah. I may also be thinking of, we use some rotoscope with some of the oh, paintings. right. So what he's also done yeah. uh, is it, it, they're taking a drawing. The rotoscope is essentially animating a still painting and taking it further. It's what we're trying to have you imagine that we do with our own paintings and most particularly photographs, which we won't have for the American Revolution. And so we're adding, say you've got a photograph of a cart. Uh, we may add the sound of that cart going across in stereo from one speaker to the other to give that sense of movement, or a bullet wave you know, going by. We might look at a, a now quiet cannon at a battlefield. I don't know if you guys have been to Valley Forge. You know, there's a cannon there. It, it, you, if you put the sound of the explosion, you could swear that cannon just went off, right? And if you can do that, you can help, help will the past to life, you know, say that it's, you know, it's an important thing. But it's, it's a really complicated thing, and it's effective in some places and not in others. And, uh, thank you. I have another question. Yeah, of course. Um, how do you receive most of your information for your documentaries? Do you read a lot? I would say most comes from reading, also from talking to scholars, from the interviews that we do, not just on camera, but the ones that we conduct with our scholars. And then we're always working. It's a process. It's not like you read and read and read and, aha, uh -huh, I know everything and I go make the film. It's that I read and read and read. You sort of have some ideas. You write a treatment. You invite a lot of people in, including scholars and other people, and they say, no, no, yep, yep, whatever it is. And you make adjustments, you write another treatment, then maybe you write a first draft, you invite all those people back, and you produce a second draft out of wholesale changes that you make there. And then somewhere along the line, maybe draft three or draft four, maybe it's even draft five, you begin editing with that. And at draft 20, where you've invited people in at, at every few drafts, uh, to look at a, a, an assembly, a rough cut, a fine cut, whatever it might be, is when you then finally say, we're done, right? So all the time, we're learning more. And I'll tell you that most of what we do is subtraction, right? Yeah. Pulling stuff out. I mean, you think if you were building something or making something, you're adding it, but you're not. You know, I, I live in New Hampshire, and we make maple syrup there, and it takes 40 gallons of maple sap to make one gallon of syrup, which is a perfect analogy to a documentary film. If we've got an 18-hour film in the Vietnam War, we've got at least 40 times that material of interviews, of footage, of still photographs that we have available uh, to use. And it's sort of what to not use becomes 
important. You know, you could imagine that a block of stone was delivered to a sculptress's studio and she bangs away at it, and every time she chips something off, it's just rubble on the floor of the studio. And what we see in the gallery or in the museum is the end product, but she's still aware of the negative space of creation, what's not there, right? If you're a musician, the note you didn't play. You know what I'm saying? And, and yet, to show you about our process, the last things we do in a film are usually adding something, because we've learned something new. And it makes something more complicated, because I think then people also try to make things very simple, binary, good, bad, yes, no kind of things. And there's nothing like that. There's no perfect hero, and there's no completely bad villain. And that you, you often find interesting aspects of humanity in your villains, and you find, you know, flaws in your heroes. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, these are not perfect human beings. And I think it makes it more interesting to know all of those aspects. Are they, King and Lincoln, overwhelmingly great? You bet. Uh, argue, you know, it, without a doubt, unarguably, in the top five human beings, I think, who call themselves Americans, meaning since this declaration happened. But they're still not perfect, as obviously was Thomas Jefferson not, as was George Washington, another slave owner not. Um, you know, so what we find telling complicated, we have a neon sign in our editing room, and it, and it, it lights up and says, it's complicated. And that's really important to do, had to have undertone, you know what I mean? You walk out into the ocean, and you know, you're feeling the waves going one way, but underneath you feel the pull the other way. Yes, right behind you. Um, you guys are so smart. I hope people tell you that all the time. Uh, I know you touched on this like uh, for a second, but like, how do you use music and like different compositions to make your stories more powerful and? Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, Winsett Marsalis, who is the head of Jazz at Lincoln Center and a great composer and trumpet player, um, is in our jazz series. We made a big series on the history of jazz, but he's also in the country music series because there's, there are no borders in music to the musicians. You know, he says in the film, art tells the tale of us coming together, meaning there are no distinctions. Ray Charles is listening to country music, and when he's given creative control of an album for the first time, he makes an album, was a huge bestseller called Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music. You know, I mean, it's just the idea that somehow only black people listen to R&B and only white people listen to country is just belied by the truth and the history of it. So Winton calls music the art of the invisible. And if you think about it, that's really true, right? There's two notes, and it, it's, it's the fastest, the quickest, and you can't see it. So it works so well. And so music is a huge force, and what most people, filmmakers, do is they add it at the end, like frosting on a cake, hoping to increase the flavor of it, right? We bake it in. We record our music ahead of time. It's, it's there very early in the editing process, and it's dictating the pace and rhythm of our editing. So for us, music is the, one of the most central forces in all the films that we make, and particularly if the subject is music, it's even more so. Does that answer your question? I mean, we literally... I mean, it's called a score, right? And that's a mathematical term, meaning an orchestra sits and watches the action on the film, and they want that moment to hit just when the action happens. And they go, wait, 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 we missed it. Where were the, what were the French horns doing, right? We never do that. We have our narrator read not to picture, as almost all narrators do, read to picture. We'll change our picture. We want the narrator to get the meaning right first. We want the music to have the baseline of what it is. So we will we'll cut to the music, not the other way around. And, and I think that makes it better. But everybody's got their own way. Um, does your process usually change with each film, or does it usually stay the same? Um, that's a really good question, too. I, I would say both. That is to say, you keep thinking you would learn something, and you realize that each project you do has its own just complete set of new things in which you have to remake the wheel. At the same time, we've been doing this for a long time, so there's something about the process that we've finally gradually begun to trust. I mean, after my first film, I thought, oh God, I'll never be able to make another film again. And that film was so different from the first film. Oh my, I know, how will I do it? And, you know, it probably took 15 years before I just stopped 
constantly waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning with a pit in my stomach, right? Now I have to wake up about money, whether we're going to raise enough money for it or stuff like that. But I think I trust that the extraordinary people who work with me, and that's one of the unfair things that I'm sitting up here, is that I really represent, I'm like the conductor of an orchestra of really great writers and producers and editors and other uh, folks in the process. And um, together, I think we've learned how to trust the process, even at its worst moment. I always feel like, oh, I know what to do. And even if I suggest what we do and I come in the next day and I realize that was terrible, I can see that it was terrible. I have no problem saying that was the stupidest idea ever and changing it. And too often you see stuff out there that you don't like. It's somewhere along the line somebody just lets something slide. And these truths are not just about my work, it's about any work that you choose to do. About that attention, listening to the weak voice inside of you going, I'm not sure that works, and I'm not sure that's right. That's a good voice to listen to. That It may be wrong, but you need to test it out. And always, obviously, do your very, very best, and not settle. And what we do too often is we settle. I just try not to settle. I mean, I work in public broadcasting, which means I get to, pu I get to publish, I get to broadcast, my director's cut every time I finish a film. I don't have to add anything later on. Well, they made me cut this scene or they wouldn't let me use this person. All the excuses you hear back in Hollywood don't happen. Yes, sir, on the end. Uh, hi, I just want to know like, who inspires you? Now? Yeah, and when you first started. Yeah, well, I. My dad was an anthropologist, that's the study of man. He taught at a college level, but he was also an amateur photographer. And so my very first memory is of him building a dark room and then developing pictures in a dark room with the smell and the funny light and stuff like that. I went to Hampshire College, as I was saying, and I, it's just funny, I just visited his grave this week. Uh, my mentor, who died in 2011, um, after a long life, was a great still photographer and, and sometime filmmaker who taught me more about how to be a person um, as he did that, and as he did, you know, film and photography. And I've been very fortunate with every film that I've worked on that you saw, there's always been somebody who stood out, or some bodies who stood out, and have, have been really great teachers for us. Most of them have been way older, but one, like Winton, who I'm, he, he and I, he, we're brothers, and, and like we just have said this for the last 20 years, it's like, I've known him for almost 30 years, but it's like we're doing this gig on country music at Jazz at Lincoln Center, right? Where we're going to do three nights of concerts with Emmy Lou Harris and Marty Stewart and you know other people from the country world mixing with the jazz world, and it's he and I are are, are very very close, and he's younger than I am, but was a great teacher, and so I've been very fortunate, and I think that I've been inspired recently by people, uh, the kids at Parkland the parents of the Newtown students uh, for, to deal with drug stuff. I think uh, I've known, I've been very fortunate to know and continue to know uh, President Obama, who I think was, you know, uh, the last president of the United States. And um, he was. Um, you know, so I think, I think our inspirations are everywhere. And then since my subject matter is history, I get to know lots of people from who are long gone. You know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you know, Thomas Jefferson, for all the flaws, he nevertheless wrote the second greatest sentence in the English language, right? The first is, of course, I love you. Don't forget that. The second is, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's phenomenal. He distilled a century of enlightenment thinking into one sentence. And even though he couldn't live out, as Dr. King said, the true meaning of our creed, he wrote the creed, and when, when he said all men are created equal, he meant all white men of property free of debt. We don't mean that now. And that's the glory of those words, is that they continue, at least so far, to expand. And that the pursuit of happiness isn't about what happiness is, and it's not materialistic. It's lifelong learning. That's what the founders felt. That was capital H happiness, was to be engaged with improving yourself all your life, never stopping your education. I don't mean necessarily formally being in school, but never stop being curious. And it wasn't the objective anyway, it was the pursuit. That that was the deliverance. That just wishing 
to be better, smarter, more thoughtful, is it. It's the pursuit of happiness. We're a nation in the process of becoming. We're never going to get there. It's, it's as if happiness is an is a, is a ideal we can't attain. But unless you work towards it, you don't have it. And that leaves, that leaves us Americans pretty unsatisfied and pretty curious, pretty hardworking, and pretty much pointed in a, in a positive future direction. You know what I mean? So those teachers are all around, even when they got complicated undertow. And our tendency is to talk about the gentleman who was saying that the internet is filled with people who said what was wrong with the film, is that we tend to throw people out without, any, without giving it a second thought. Oh, you're bad. Boy, you're gone. You don't exist anymore. Instead of understanding that they that there's complication, that it's complicated. Yes. Um, what are your what are your top five narrative films? Negative films? Nar narrative. Narrative. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said negative. I don't know. I like Akira Kurosawa's The Seventh Samurai. I like uh, Citizen Kane by Orson Welles. I like um, a film by a Spanish-French director named Luis Buñuel, who's a kind of surrealist called The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, and about 10 other films that he made. I like The Godfather, part one and two. I like, I like It's a Wonderful Life by Frank Capra, which is a two and a half, two hour and 40 minute film about a guy who wants to commit suicide and it's played every Christmas time. And it is the director's favorite movie and it is its lead star, Jimmy Stewart's favorite movie and it's about a guy who wants to commit suicide. And does, and tries, right? Um, I, I, I love lots of, of films. I've seen uh, the one that should have won the best picture uh, this year called, was called Roma. It won best foreign picture. I haven't seen a film as good as that since that director, Alfonso Cuaron, made a film, a couple films back in his thing. He made Gravity, but a couple films before that, he made a film called The Children of Men. And that's, I, I think that's a perfect film. I just watched it the other night. It happened to be on, and I pressed restart, which for someone my age is like, uh oh, the universe is gonna fall apart. Um, but I watched it again from the beginning and it's like a flawless, perfect film. There's lots of really good filmmakers out. It's un almost unfair to make a list because it's like apples and oranges, you know, about uh, about what you would, uh, would pick. What's your favorite? Um, my, f my favorite is uh, is also Children of Men, actually. Yeah, it's a great but film. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it just became a favorite. I s actually just watched it a few days back. My That's okay, it That's okay. It's okay, you know. It's really great when a film comes up and grabs you like that and takes over, even though it's I don't know what it must be fifteen years old by now. You know, it's a really really great film. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, how? Ha oh, weird hearing that go. Um, how have your films after each individual one like changed your perspective on the world and how you see it? Well, I'm not sure that you can ever really. You know how Pearl is made. So a pearl is actually irritation, right? It's a grain of sand that gets in there and gets kind of worked by the, by the oyster, right? And so you never know how each layer is imperceptibly added, but at the end, it's pretty wonderful. So I know that doing what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing, and I know that when I'm done with each film, I, there's a, something that's incredibly bittersweet about it. It's sad that you're leaving it, but also satisfied that it's done, and then you're really back onto the new film. So you never say, oh, in this film I learned X, in this film I learned Y, you know, that sort of thing. But you know, I, mean, I hope, um, that we're getting better at it, or that, you know, we're tackling things and are able to handle more complicated and, and more interesting and um, richer subjects as we go along. But, you know, I, I happen to have a a job that lets me understand sort of the nature of who we are, which is really exciting. And it's not, it's not like a secret, but it's really hard to articulate, and it has to do with those themes that are always there, like freedom, like race, like leadership, like war, like hard times, like innovation, like art, 
uh, all of the things that keep bubbling up to the surface that are who we are and that seem to be recurring in each film that we do. I don't believe history repeats itself. Mark Twain is supposed to have said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And that means that every time I finish a film, I lift up and I realize how much every film I've made, however distant in the past it was, however close to the present it was, rhymes significantly with this present moment. I mean, it's just eerie in all the films, all the films that we've done. I mean, we just finished this film on, on country music, I don't know what you think about country music. It doesn't really matter because it's not one thing. It's like so many different things that it's hard to say, well, I don't like country music, meaning, you know, it's just too wide and, and diverse a thing. But we finished it editorially before the Me Too movement started. Every episode has got a Me Too moment where a woman just said, what are you doing? No. Right? I mean, it just really, in a way ahead of rock and roll, but obviously ahead of jazz which is one of the most male chauvinist organizations on earth, and, uh, and way ahead of rock and way ahead of folk and all this sort of stuff, were people you know, like Loretta Lynn writing Don't Come Home and Drinkin' with Lovin' on Your Mind, which in the mid-60s is a woman saying, I have the right to my own body. There's a, such a thing called spousal or relationship rape. Uh, I get to control this dynamic, not you, Buster. And um, every woman in country music seems to have that kind of backbone, that kind of spine. And I swear to God, even though the film is coming out this, this September, by the time all of that was fully formed in the editing room is when the Me Too movement came out. And we kind of went, here we go again. It's exactly about the present. Um. Have you ever been interested in pursuing uh, more narrative films, or have you always been drawn to documentaries? So, uh, yes, the answer, the very simple answer is yes. And I said before, I started off wanting to be that. And every once in a while, Hollywood comes calling and wants me to do something. And it's never actually gotten to the place where I was going to surrender my day job, because I hated the controls. I hated the compromises. I hated the idea that you would change a true story in such a way as to add what they thought were more dramatic features. But let me tell you something, which is the laws of storytelling are the same for Steven Spielberg, and I've sat on the stage like this and talked to him about that, as they are for me, as they are for you when somebody says, honey, how was your day? Right? You have to, you can't go, I back slowly down the driveway, avoiding the garbage can at the curb unless somebody T-bones you at that, and that's exactly how you tell that story, right? So we are all possessed by storytelling art. So, I mean, a lot of documentaries can be just kind of like homework, but, you know, a lot of feature filmmakers can't figure out what the story is. So we've been telling, we've been telling stories, and there's, there, the difference is, is that Steven Spielberg can make stuff up, and I can't. And that's the only difference. The same laws apply to it. So I am making narrative films. My style of documentary film, our style of documentary film, is narrative. We tell stories. And they're true stories. You know, and, and the art comes in how they're presented, what you've left in, what you've left out. You know, all of the things we've been talking about today. But it's the same thing with Spielberg. And I swear to God, we've sat and had this, you know, he said, brother from another mother. You know? And look, you know, he's doing, he did a film called The Post, right, about the breaking of the story of the, of the Watergate, uh, I mean, of the Pentagon Papers, right? We just finished our Vietnam War. He did Lincoln. He said he made everyone in the cast watch my entire 12 hours two or three times over, particularly the stars of the film, right? You know, Sally Field and Daniel Day-Lewis and all of those people. So it's, you know... This stuff, I, there's a young Hollywood director named Scott Cooper who made, um, what was that movie about the country singer, Tender Heart? Uh, crazy. crazy Heart. Crazy Heart. And he made a film, a Western called Hostiles, which was one of the best films a couple of years ago that I'd seen. Didn't get much traction. He's now working on another film. He says he's given all the stars, Robert Duvall and all the other people, uh, the, the Civil War series and a couple of other series that we've done in the West so that they'd be prepared for, for understanding I think it's still narrative. I mean, you may look up someday and see, you know, HBO's interested in doing our film on Jack Johnson, the first African-American heavyweight champion. 
you know, but only when they think black stuff will sell. And that you can, I would just say, hold your breath, you know, because, you know, TV is. And I'd rather make a documentary on Jack Johnson, which nobody, you know what the title of that film was? Did you see? Remember? Unforgivable Blackness. The Rise and Fall of Jack Johnson. And, you know, my, even my network had to, had to swallow hard. And they said, what's it called? Jack Johnson? You always have such straight titles. They go, not this time. And it's what you, you've heard of W.E.B. Du Bois, the great scholar at the turn of the century, 19th to 20th century. He's the one who looked at it and said, you know, there are other people who are having the same problem with girlfriends and uh, questions of lifestyle and stuff like that. But they're all white. It all comes down to his unforgivable blackness, which is why they had to destroy him. Yes. Out of all the films you created, which one was your favorite, or which one did you enjoy creating the most? Uh, which is the favorite child that you're, of your parents? <laughs> you, right. So Duke Ellington was once asked what, you know, Duke Ellington's our greatest composer, and certainly the most prolific composer um, in American history, and he was asked what his most important uh, uh, composition was, and he said the one I'm working on now. So I feel that. It's the ones I'm working on now. I don't have favorites. I have four daughters. Um, I would be, I think, a pretty bad parent if I said that. I've been able to put, as I said, because I've worked in public broadcasting, everything into all the films, and um, and so I, I can't have a favorite. I, I don't. I know that some are are you know the most famous, like the Civil War, now the Vietnam War in another way. But I like this film I made on the Shakers, the celibate religious sect, as much as I like the Civil War. You know. And I'm sure your parents like you the best. Oh, right here. So I'm starting to pick up this habit that my mom hates a lot. So like, when we go out to we like, work this out here. <laughs> when we go out to like watch movies or we watching TV shows, I tend to watch them by like a filmmaker standpoint and not to enjoy it. So do you also have this problem too? I do not have this problem. What? So this is what we live in a society that is over analyzing stuff, right? You just got to be an audience. Like Steven Spielberg, if you watch him watch a film, he's like a little kid, right? He believes everything, you know? Oh no, that dinosaur is going to step out of the screen and stomp on me too, even though he knows that that dinosaur he made, and it's all mechanical, or else it's just generated in a computer, right? So I do watch films, I guess, with my accumulated knowledge of how films are made. So I can sometimes look at a movie and go, oh, oh, she's dead. Like just the way a character is introduced, right? Or you go, oh man, he is not making it through the film, right? Because you just know, and it tells you a little bit about what's wrong with Hollywood. You know already, right? But, but for the most part, I, I, I like to be entertained. And I'll tell you, it is so hard to make a movie, as I guess some of you are involved in trying to make movies now. It's so hard to make a movie that just it getting done, it, I'm like happy for them. They got it done. Do I now want to spend the next two hours, you know, ragging on it? I don't need to do that, right? So uh, I'd go halfway between your mom. It's all right to understand the dynamics of filmmaking, but you it, don't lose that wide-eyed ability to go, whoa. You know what I mean? Because that's all life's about, right? It's just the whoa. And I don't mean W O E sadness, but W H O A. Whoa. We have time for one more. One more? Yeah. Who's, got, who's got the speaking stick? Oh, well, there's got the speaking stick. Yeah. We'll do two. Don't be so. Don't. Don't. I knew he was going to do that. Earlier today, I was watching, I was looking at your catalog, and I seen that you won The Simpsons. I've been on The Simpsons like four times. Like the first two times, they didn't use my voice. And, and I think they were afraid to because it was, you know, kind of insulting uh, thing. And, um, and so I went back and I overdubbed it for them because they did invite me later on. I said, why did you do that? I mean, I'm happy to be insulted by you guys. And I'm happy to read. Just don't put someone else imitating my voice, please. You know, that didn't work, yeah. And a lot, you know, we, I've been on Parks and Rec. I mean, I, you know, two dozen things. It, it apparently is a sign that you're part of the culture when people start making fun of you or put you in as symbolic stuff. It's actually kind of fun that they make fun of you. 
Yes, there's oh. Is there something you wanted to make a film about but haven't had the chance to do yet? Yeah, Dr. King. Um, I, I said all through the 90s that that, that that was the film that I didn't think I could do because I thought the family was too controlling and I couldn't make a film in which I'd sit in front of you and say, it's not really as good as I wanted it to be because the family wouldn't do this. And it was very coincidentally the family wrote me and said, we think you're the, the, the guy to do the film on our dad, our husband, Coretta was still alive. And I said, you are right, I am the person to do it. <laughs> and I went there and in one day in Atlanta I realized they weren't going to let him go. And I can, I can understand and I can forgive because this is a man, a father and a husband they could not control in life. And they're trying desperately to control in death. And that's a disservice to the rest of us, but it may help them come to terms with what they had and what they lost in a way that we, it's only symbolic for us, right? It's meaningful, but it's symbolic for us. And so that's, that's the one. But I'm still, I'm right now we're out making, in, interviewing some of those folks that are still alive from the early days of the civil rights movement, like John Lewis and Gary Belafonte and Andrew Young and people like that, because they're not going to be around forever. And when I do get a chance to make that film, I want to make sure I've got people who knew him and talked to him and could tell you what kind of person he was. Right? So we're, we're you know, haven't given up. Okay, so one more. That was two. Wait, wait, wait. I've got to ask somebody in the back who's not asked a question yet. Hi, I'm sorry. I don't need a microphone. Please, no microphone. I just wanted to know, how long does it take you to put like all your documentaries together? It depends. The length of time it takes depends on the length of the film, more often than not. But I, it took me five years, five and a half years, to make my first film on the Brooklyn Bridge, just because I looked like I was 12 years old and I was trying to sell people the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, it took 10 and a half years to make the Vietnam series, but it's 10 episodes in 18 hours. And it took less than that to do nearly as long country music, and sometimes on what we call smaller films, which are usually two, two hours, we're working on a three-part, six-hour film on the life of the writer Ernest Hemingway, and these will take three, four years to do, but it's, we're not working on it every single day. There are people that are, and we're taking our time. You can't rush it. You can't impose yourself on the material. Otherwise, they don't have the durability or the, the legs, the ability to, to last that the films do have uh, because we're engaging them on multiple levels, as I was saying, and, and complicated ones, and we want to be able to tolerate that complication in all the films. And that just takes a while. I mean, maybe there's smarter people who could do it faster than us, but I, I don't think we can rush it. No, so. I, I completely agree with you, because when people rush with movies, you kind of don't get the, like, uh, the girl over there, like how she said that um, when you're watching movies, you kind of suspect everything. Yes, no, no, you do understand, you can see, it, it's, it's, it's lawful, you know? I mean, they... Whoever made the film is exposed in whatever they put together. And it may have to do with limitations they couldn't control, or it may have to do with them rushing through it and turning it out really quickly or whatever it is. And there are people who are really good at hyping a film, and the film isn't that good. You know, it's just not that good. And they're really good, the subject's great, and you know, why, like, why didn't that do something to me? And we should have. It happens to me all the time. You know. Thank you. Thank you all. time to me, for me not to get in trouble with Adrian. There so. you go. <laughs> so can we just do one more round of applause for both of these <laughs> celebrate you all as well because you all did a fantastic job. You never know what sort of questions people are going to come up with or if they're even going to ask questions. Yeah. You all asked really good really questions. Good questions. Yeah. Really Seriously. Good. So I want to thank you all so much for coming out and spending this much time with us this afternoon. And in fact, we actually want to give you a little bit of a bigger thank you because we know that we sped you through the galleries and you all were asking such great questions upstairs as well. You didn't get to see all the things. So every student in here is going to get two tickets to come back to the museum for free whenever you want. <laughs> Thank you.
So as you all are heading out, the people who led your tours in the galleries, they're going to meet you by your coats and backpacks, and they're going to distribute your tickets to you so that everybody gets a pair for you to use whenever it is that you want to come back. Thank you all again so much. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day, and hopefully we'll see you again.